What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Watch Talk with the Cardinal, guys. I hope you guys are doing well. We've got a lot of great friends, a lot of familiar faces stopping by. I just want to say thank you all for joining me. Today, guys, we're going to be talking about the world of vintage, vintage watches, and if they're overlooked in the current kind of modern wristwatch craze. Of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that intro, the best intro in the wristwatch game made by my man Claude C. Really appreciate that. Of course, that is also the Watch and Learn intro. That's a weekly series myself and my man, JJ LeCoute do. And um, yeah, we talk about wristwatch news, all the new wristwatch news that the community uh, has, and uh, ultimately recap it for you guys in a uh, kind of succinct way. So of course, before we begin today's topic, I just want to do a quick wristwatch check. What am I wearing? I'm wearing the Old Faithful, the Note 8 Sub. This is what it's all about, guys. Simple wind and wear timeless classic right here that is really really what it's all about all righty let's say hello to the familiar faces in the chat we got tim wright who can't stop by earlier he's got to go to the frederick constant wearing dentist and get his teeth fixed unfortunately we got ryan singer stopping by saying hit that like button i appreciate that rt215 appreciate that he's got a great uh, conversation starts as most of my collection is vintage chronographs. I love vintage pieces. Imagine having to tool those watches without CNC machining and computer programs. Mind blowing if you think about the position. Absolutely a hundred percent. No question about it. We got Batch Guitar joining us. Thank you for stopping by. We got Tony Bazan. Hope you're well, my man. Hope you are well. We got I'm gonna butcher this name, so I'm not even gonna test to it. He says the 18238. Well that's Neo Vintage. Vintage, I like Hoyer, Hotel, Hoyer Otavio to be specific. Listen, I tend to agree with you. I think a lot of these kind of vintage style chronographs, mainly from Tag Hoyer and the likes, are tremendous value for money. But again, we're going to get into it in a little bit. We got Logan Hall saying, F me dead. What a lineup in the cover photo. Yeah, absolutely. Marty Evans joining us from 5 a.m. in Brisbane. We got William Watch's podcast. We got Yasha. We got Nick saying vintage watches is a minefield, 100%. JBJB. We got Paul M joining us. Thank you, thank you. And we got the whole crew. We got Night Wrist Watchmen. Thank you, everybody, for stopping by. I guess what I'll do is I'll drop the link if anybody wants to join. We got also Nick Jones, Eddie Fu, Herb Minard. Thank you guys all for joining me. As usual, appreciate the kind words and support. And um, I'm going to drop the link if anybody wants to join in. Of course, it's more than welcome. We do already have a question from Eddie Fu who says, Marco, what is the most undervalued Rolex in your pen? Actually, I take zero credit for this pick, but it's actually the two-tone GMT. Um, and this one was brought to me by a viewer. His name is Wes. And these sell for actually amazing prices on the secondary market. I mean, you could find it for relatively great prices about what i paid for this submariner my note 8 sub and uh had i known that i probably would have gotten this instead all things considered i mean this is a tremendous watch right here value for money you get two-tone gmt from rolex modern build quality modern construction the green gmt hand i think this is a no-brainer no question about it absolutely no question about it and again these are you know relatively affordable let me just clock the uh one two six seven one one. Oh no, that's the that's the rose gold. Sorry. One six. Ugh. Why do these reference numbers have to be so complicated? Let me just get that. I'm just gonna look this up on Chrono Twenty Four for all of you to see. Um, here we go. There we go. So we're talking, you know, around the fifteen sixteen thousand US, which. I think it's pretty reasonable. We got our man, JD. JD you're echoing, my man. You're echoing. Am I echoing it even now? Damn. Yeah, it's okay. All right. Come back. Sorry. How's it going, man? Everything's good? Everything is well. I wanted to come into the Cardinal's nest and see what's going on. <laughs> but yeah, I just got a question. What is the most undervalued Rolex, in my opinion? I picked this one right here, the two tone GMT. 
I think this is certainly overlooked. Listen, I take no credit. We got Wes P in the chat who's here telling me, giving me a winky face. He's the one who actually put us onto this, right? I think these are tremendously undervalued right now. No question. I agree. Again, this way under like probably 2000, right? Under a steel model. It's just right. so right. weird. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. We got Design Atelier joining us. He's got a new video. I haven't checked it out yet, but I promise that I will. We got Big Papa Tony. Thank you for joining us. Raj G. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got, whew, we got cool Chris Kelly saying price going up quick on those. That's right. Um, I mean, I, I would tell you, get them while you can. Raj G saying, Marco, thoughts on the new Messina lab releases? We'll cover them Friday. Watch and learn. And we do have a super chat. We got JBJB. A good friend of the show. Thank you so much for the super chat with the 11 euros saying, yep, super chats are working. Just checking. I appreciate that, my man. You're always <laughs> to all of us. But JJ, I wanted to discuss this topic of vintage watches and are they overlooked kind of in the current market climate? And I'll tell you, man, I think they are a little bit undervalued or overlooked, but there's a lot of things in my opinion that make modern watches just a little bit better. And one thing is the size, JJ. You know, I'm used to wearing modern size. This is a 40 mil Submariner. My GMT is 40 mil. Right. My PAM is 44 mil. It's hard for me to want to go back to those kind of more conservative sizes, like 36, you know, 37 mil, because I'm just not used to it. You know what I mean? I tell you, I really uh, been enjoying staying at 40 or under lately. <laughs> <laughs> um, even the 42, I like them. Don't get me wrong; they fit me well, but. Um, I've really been enjoying staying around the 40 mark. Um, I feel it, it, it fits better on the wrist. I think we got too caught up in the early 2000s in these large sizes. Um, here's my take on vintage. This is the problem. Technology changed quite a bit in the last 10 years. I mean, you know, you're getting modern clasps. You're getting, you know, solid bracelets. Some people say they're heavy. I mean, I think they're just being ridiculous. It's not that heavy. I mean, come on. You know, ceramic bezels. Um there is something to say about the vintage feel, though. It is nice to have a, a nice, um, let's say, like a Kermit aluminum bezel. Uh, it has a certain charm. Nope, nope. Hey, welcome. Um, my whole thing is, I think, like, it depends how far back, back you go. Like, late 90s, early 2000s seems so dated. Like, it has a certain style to it. It doesn't have that timeless, you know, transition. It kind of feels like it's stuck. So I would go either way vintage, but they're too small. Or neo vintage, which is kind of dated. This is why I stay modern. That's my my take on it. Nice. I just want to say hello and welcome to our good friend, friend of the show, Design Atelier. He's got a great channel himself. Thank you for joining as always. Welcome. You welcome. guys can hear me. I don't have my earphones. Yeah, it's not bad. It's a little soft, but what I'll do is I'll just turn up your mic volume. Um, All right. This way you have. There we go. There we go. We should be able to hear you better. We got a great question from Nick Jones. Says thoughts on the Daytona V Series 2009 white dial. So I would tell, I would say again, these are great. He says APH dial. Listen, these are you know kind of a misnomer, a mistake, if you will. Obviously, they're going to be collectible for that reason, that reason alone, and the fact that they're a Daytona adds to it. But man, my favorite are those steel bezel Daytonas. I think they're really still undervalued. They got that vintage look, modern build quality, more modern kind of sporty design and look and feel to it, but still. You know, amazing, a beautiful look overall. So I think those are the ones to get those kind of neo vintage Daytonas. That I agree with. I yeah. totally agree with that because you got Zenith Daytonas going for a ton of money. You got ceramics going for a ton of money. And for some reason, what there's no respect for the first in house movement. I just don't I don't get it. Those are due they're due to explode. They they I think you're right. They if you're gonna buy gray market Buy something that's discontinued. Go for something like that. Absolutely. No brainer. And for some reason, the white dials are cheaper than the black dials. I've been noticing because I've been looking, trying to find the black dial. And for some reason, the white dials are going for a couple thousand cheaper. I don't, I'm not sure why. Yeah, the the, the look is I, – I prefer the black dials. I'm going to be honest and transparent with you. If I'm being honest, I think that the black dials so are just a little bit nicer. And sports watches, I feel, are mostly – belonging on, on black dials, apart from, I think... Um, I'm muted. I'm muted. It's all good. It's all good. I, it's, I think apart from a couple, like, watches, like the Explore 2 and stuff like that, I think those look great in white. 
Um, but mostly I like sports watches with black dials. We got JBJP with another eleven dollar, uh, eleven euro rather super chat. I appreciate that. He said just picked up a one one six six one three thirty dial. Let me pull that up. I think this is phenomenal. And, and again, this kind of harkens back to this talk of the neo vintage kind of space, right? I think this is the perfect in between where you're getting kind of that retro look, but still it, it still looks great. I love the kind of more sharp crown guards, if you will. I love the, the blue bezel. Obviously, there's the diamond accents on it. I think this is really nice. You know, it's so crazy. <laughs> I was just looking at these probably two weeks ago, hunting down for good prices, and I found some good prices. And then I said, oh, how many watches do I need? Maybe not. But you know who got me looking into these? Watch Eric. He's really into the 30 dials. Right. You know, obviously, he's going for full precious metal, which is kind of out of my range at the moment. Um, the two tones seem much more affordable, but yeah, I think these are great. I just got an amazing picture. I do want to pull this up, but um, yeah, I mean, I think these are the perfect, again, in between type of uh, aesthetic where you get the kind of, it's, it's more modern looking, you know what I mean? It's very modern looking, but it's still got that vintage charm to it. And I think that's the perfect in between. Do you guys prefer the champagne or the silver dial? I prefer the champagne, actually. It's a bit too much color with the silver dial. I don't know about you. What about you, Jason? Yeah, I think I, I think the champagne works because um, Me too. Yeah, blue and, and gold and, and yellow really goes uh, goes together well. Those are harmonious colors. Most people are attracted to that. And I got a really um, amazing collection also from friend of the show CB. I just want to pull this up. He's got some great kind of neo vintage pieces that we were just talking about. I can't list you these reference off the top of my head, but I think I know a couple of them. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, these are phenomenal. You got a date eight, yellow gold, blue dial, 36 mil, two tone sub. You got a beautiful full yellow gold Daytona. I think that's a porcelain dial actually, if I'm not mistaken. It's pretty, pretty incredible. And then you got obviously. Can you move the super color. chat? I can't. We can't see the bottom row. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Sorry about that. But yes, this was sent in by CB. And then you got that Daytona that we were just talking about, black dial. I think that looks phenomenal. Also, I mean, this is a great neo vintage type of collection. Yeah, this is really nice. Um, again, not exactly what what I shop for, but I could totally appreciate this in someone's collection. Um, he hit it on so many good levels. Uh, you know, the, he has the Pepsi, he has the black dial, Daytona, a porcelain dial, solid gold Daytona. I mean, he's he's crushing it on all levels. I love that blue that blue dial on the gold uh, day date. Yeah, a hundred percent agreed. And, and I think this is kind of the sweet spot um, in terms of Rolex. Again, it's mostly they mostly have a modern style and modern aesthetic to it, which is a hundred percent in my opinion, what people should be going for. But one thing, obviously, to note, JJ, is that vintage is a minefield, right? And that's kind of one thing that works against them. Um, uh, I would say in this instance, you know, you got to buy the dealer. You know what I mean? You really have to buy yeah, the dealer. It's, it's not worth getting trying to get a steal of a deal unless you find, like, some old grandma selling her husband's full box and papers, you know, collections when he passes. CB says the porcelain is inverted six and 200-mile bezel. Jesus. So if you see this right here, this 200, and then I think it's probably has to do with the gradation, the the gradation on the dial is pretty incredible. Jesus, that is incredible. Oh, we got design. I told you just left and turned back. Boaster brings up a good point. He said some vintage subs came on President's bracelets, which is pretty epic. Yeah, 100. percent So I'm gonna pull this up. And this is the reference 1680 with that president's bracelet. That looks now pretty damn incredible. Bottom. Yeah, this is pretty damn incredible. This is baller if you ask me. Right. This I like a lot. These got to be, you know, quite, a, quite really a bit like, of money. Do you appreciate it? Like these? Uh, I have no idea, honestly. But, I mean, they must be collectible, right? To come on a president's bracelet, that that's pretty – I would assume that's pretty rare. That you believe. Right. Uh, there's also some that came they came on Jubilee, some of them, right? If I'm not mistaken. No. 
Or no, it was um, mostly oyster bracelet, but then there was some with this kind of president style bracelet also. Um, if they're, I'm not mistaken. They're pretty iconic, um, in my opinion. Many people, many brands are like trying to emulate that, that, that sort of combination. Right. right. And, and that's the point, right? Is that vintage Rolex is certainly collectible. But I think, listen, there's a lot of underappreciated bargains out there. I think there's Universal Geneve made great chronographs. I think there's also Hoyer chronographs that are super underappreciated. But and again, I come, keep coming back to this. There's a lot of things that work out of favor with vintage watches in particular. One of them, in my opinion, being um, overall the the size of it. The size is typically obviously a little bit smaller, which we're not really used to. The second being the movement. Some of these have like, you know, kind of vintage movements that just aren't used today. So how are you going to get those watches serviced? That's something definitely I'm sure a lot of collectors consider and I think uh, another thing is just overall the the quality and build of it. It's just people like new, right? They like new things. They want to be the ones to put the kind of scratches into it. Um, I think maybe the vintage watch market will definitely continue to appreciate. I mean, there's no question about it. There's a vintage collector community out there um, that is extremely strong. But I think overall what we might see is the vintage market kind of waning for the next kind of couple of years as we see a lot of kind of new money pouring into the watch market and then ultimately we'll see kind of a trace back to the vintage market if that's kind of my guess because listen i'm a new collector i see also a lot of new collectors entering into the market and they're mostly buying modern watches it just takes time ultimately to build up your tastes and ultimately get into that vintage market it's not something that you just jump straight into yeah usually you have a like a pretty full normal collection, if that's a good word for it, before right. you start venturing off into vintage. For the most part, I don't know anyone who just jumps into the watch game and says, I'm going vintage, all vintage, you know, with no, like, um, modern backbone to the, to the collection. And we got West P saying, watch car, I've just gone a pre-ceramic Coke and having a modern stuff, so I can't get over how much better it wears on me. It'll vary by wrist, of course, but I'm sold. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's some people that will prefer the kind of light as the lightness of a pre-ceramic uh, kind of either sub or pre-ceramic GMT. Um, personally, I love the Glidelock class. I love the modern bracelet construction of a modern uh, Rolex, and that's what I have in the collection. But who knows? Maybe in the future I will uh, definitely try to get some some uh, vintage into, uh, into the fold. We got Logan Hall saying, I'm wearing my Neo Vintage Rolex Datejust 16013. It's the jingly jangly jubilee, man. Jingly jangly. <laughs> that, and CB makes a point. He bought them new. So, you know, you got to realize that too. A lot, a lot of people have these watches, bought them when they were new, and now they're vintage. So it's going to, the same thing's going to happen, you know, in. 20 years from now when people are looking at like our collections that we bought watches that we would never sell because we got them whatever a special story saying oh these guys collect vintage well not really i mean we kind of turned into like a neo vintage right know? i mean he's been collecting over 40 years i think at this point right so like uh, obviously he's never sold a watch in his collection and at this point he's got watches you know that he's owned for you know well over 20 30 some even close to 40 years so you know, at that point, they become vintage over time, but it's not like he's ever, ever uh, bought them. Yeah, hunted really. them down. Like he knows exactly where they came from. You know what I mean? Exactly. He knows he's the original owner. Right. Original. Right. Hey, which comes with a premium, you especially. Have... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jason. You can like swap, swap for a, a, a few scraps here and there, and if you have like a modest collection, you have a, a nice rotation, then you know, that eliminates or not that limits it, that limits the the wear and tear of Right. We got Mr. Cassio saying, how do you avo avoid redials? Omega enthusiasts on Instagram only seems to show near perfect dials. Can they all be real? Listen, some are real. There's no question about it. I'd say in this case, you have to 100% buy the dealer. You know what I mean? You have to go to a vintage watch expert. You can't you know, muck around with somebody online on Chrono24 and buy a, a vintage watch from them unless they're a really reputable seller. I think in this case, you really have to seek out a dealer who will source that perfect model for you, someone who you trust, um, somebody who has credibility, you know, has reviews uh, from customers in the past and testimonies that show that you know they have a solid track record. Um, we do have a question. Like, um, like, uh, if there's um, but because like some 
back in the day, when you sent um, these watches to serve, they would like to replace those dials. They're actually still uh, original dials, it's just that it's not the original that came with the watch. Right. Right. So they're still original right. dials. They're just they're they're still from Omega originally, but they're not original to the watch itself. Yeah, but I do I do see what on John's uh, point is because there are some, and we they the, they're blatantly even like they're showing it on Facebook. They actually buy original dials and they swap it themselves. So, <laughs> and right. that that's that's. That's the the pitfalls that you really need do need to learn. Yeah, with like Mars um, and Saturn, you have to like do your research and whatnot. Jason, I think we like you're kind of cutting in and out. It's probably better without the actual headphones than with the headphones. If I'm being 100 percent. All right. I think it's like it's 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 kind of the connection and the yeah the connection here in the office is always bad. Oh, so thanks for having me anyway. Nope. No, listen, Jason, you can stick around. If ever, obviously, there's a, you get to a better location, by all means, always free, feel free to jump on. Pleasure having you on, man. All right, man. Thanks. Take care. Hey, hey, Marco, what do you think about the uh, logo? What do you think? I like it a lot. That's the logo, right? That's the logo that our guy our guy uh, made for you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate it. When he comes on, we got to say thank you. Uh, that's Private Studio <laughs> Montreal, I think. That's right. the, that's the guy. We got a question from HBA saying best investment, vintage or modern Rolex. Well, guess what? I'm not a financial right. advisor, so I can't tell you, man. There's no such thing as investing in watches. You gotta buy what you like. Lord of Flex says I've got a good watchmaker that services just about anything and anything for res reasonable prices for old movements like early Edda. Find a nice amateur and let him practice. <laughs> that's probably a bad idea. But yeah, I think, listen, I think um, there is an idea that um, vintage watches will make a resurfacing. I like the idea that vintage watches are something that people will appreciate in the future. But uh, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm, I'm just a fan of modern watches, JG. I don't know if you saw my most recent video. I did my lottery watch collection, right? My dream watch collection of money was no object. And every single one of them were modern watches. Hmm. I'm get a quicker draw in the house. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, quicker draw. Bob One says, JJ and Marco, two classics. Thank you, Bob One. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bob One. Appreciate that. Yeah. We got Boaster saying, I was watching a super old AC3 video of a guy that inherited a vintage gold braid and was trading it in for a two-tone sub. The pitfalls of bequeathing a treasured watch onto a relative. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's the issue, right? I mean, a lot of people's tastes, lest we forget, are not into those kind of dress watches. I personally really <laughs> like them. It's probably what I'm going towards next, but um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you get a uh, guys that just aren't uh, aren't into watches like that. They just don't appreciate what they receive, you know. Which is kind of it, it is kind of like bad to think about, you know. Can you imagine you work your entire life to get these amazing watches, but then ultimately you don't even know what you have, and you just sell it to get something else, or they sell it to get something else, which is. Ah. Uh, I mean, sorry about that. I was just plugging in my charger, but uh, it's a, uh, it's a shame when you just don't have the same style as someone, especially like a relative. You think you're passing them down something they're gonna treasure like you did, and they just don't appreciate it. Um, right. I mean, <clears throat> I would keep it for sentimental reasons. I don't think that's a tool you should use for bartering. But you know, that's uh, we got Alexido with a great question saying how do you define vintage that seems to be used for every watch out of production so i would say every watch out of production is kind of neo vintage right it would be like new vintage or i don't know like i, I would say 10 years or more is probably neo vintage and then probably 30 years or more is probably vintage i don't know about you jj well i'll equate it to the car world the way they do insurance for cars is usually um 25 years is um, considered vintage, and I think 40 is classic, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe the other way around, but it's pretty. that's pretty much the guy. Like 25 years, I would say, after 10 years, I would say is neo-vintage, and then after 25, I would say is vintage. After 40, it's like fucking ancient. I don't know. <laughs> it's old, though. You know, right. So. But yeah, I think that's a good standard, actually, to have, dude. I think that's a very good standard. I, I, like, I wouldn't say the Explorer 139 mil is, like, neo-vintage. You know what I mean? They just retired it. So. 
I would say a minimum 10 years. Oh, I never knew this. So he says, you can find an old Edda for 1400 $1, just a few bucks. So if it gets screwed, you can just replace the entire movement. Ah, I see. So, but, but then you'd basically be spending your money to teach the watchmaker how to service a watch. <laughs> I don't know if that's a great idea. But, I mean, listen, if you can buy it. Or just quick a few quick correction. I said ancient. Antique is the word I was looking for. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, ancient antique. In the car world, the car is considered antique after 25. Okay, so we could say neo vintage is 10 years or more, right? And then vintage is 25 or more. I, I like that. That's a good standard. That's a fair standard. Yeah, I, I would say rough, yeah, roughly. Yeah, you'd have to hit the 25 year mark to really be officially vintage. Um, 10 could be neo vintage, and after 40, I would say is like an antique, you know, after 40 years old. I'm going to pull this up in one second. I just want to get. Uh, this right over here. We got Kurt Antonini with a five dollar super yeah. chat, and we got the Omega two five three one dot eighty. Let me pull that up. Omega two five three one. Hey, someone wrote ancient. Kurt Antonini wrote ancient is a sundial. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the uh, in on the fence vintage. Anything earlier vintage. Anything newer not. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I think, uh, what are we approaching? We're approaching, we must be approaching close to 20, 25 years of this, right? So I think it's certainly, I mean, you're getting to a point where a lot of the loom plots are starting to be discolored in a lot of the models I see online. Um, they're, they're definitely starting to become more patinaed. I would consider these, you know, right on the fence of vintage, if not vintage altogether. Again, I think that 25 years is kind of the cutoff point. I think 25 is a good number. What do you think, JJ? No, nothing. I don't think he has any thoughts on it. But yeah, I, I think it's certainly getting to that point. Hey, sorry, Marco. I was grabbing a piece of tape. I had it muted. <laughs> what, did you, what did you say? This was no, good, no, uh, nothing. I there. think this is becoming vintage, right? He said, I think the exited production in like 2000, right? So I think it's right on the cusp of becoming a vintage watch, in my opinion. And I just mentioned, like, a lot of the watches you'll see online, their loom plots uh, are becoming a lot more patinaed. So yeah, I think that's right on the cusp in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, I, I got to say, honest, in my opinion, this is still neo-vintage. Right. Um, in my mind, anything in the 90s is still neo-vintage. I, I can't say you're in the you're in the vintage realm until you're in the 80s. Um, even that sounds funny to me, but, but I have to face facts, I guess. You know, I would say like 60s and 70s are more vintage in my mind. But like going into the 80s, I guess now... Starting to go into the 90s is going to start being vintage soon, I guess. But, um, yeah, Marco, you're going to be vintage in three years. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's a different standard, right? It's a different standard between yeah. – uh, Oh, look right. at I, this. I would say those are still neo-vintage, just from the styling perspective. Right. We oh, got, no. I, I don't know. I'm not going to even try to attempt to pronounce his name. But he says, send you an email of my new remote watch box. We have a beautiful – I believe that's a root beer – and a vintage day date. Look at this. We've been talking vintage. This is definitely a vintage day date. I don't know if it's a quick set. I can't really tell uh, what the reference is, but I'm sure you can let us know down in the chat. I'll be happy to pull that up for you, man. Congratulations. It looks like a great case. And I don't know what that third watch is, but it's got my interest. It looks like almost like a ladies Nautilus. I think so. Just based on the, er, yeah. I'm pretty, oh, I see it looks the like some, in the day date. No, you see at oh, the end. peeking out. Yeah, yeah. It looks like a Nautilus. Yeah, yeah. Right. But those plots, I'm pretty sure, of the ladies' models, if I'm not mistaken, those more rounded plots as opposed to the square ones on uh, the men's one. But, hey, I'm not, not 100% sure. Difficult to tell from the uh, the picture itself. And we got Juliet Arariba saying Marco Speedmaster versus Navitimer. I think you could definitely make an argument for either. They're probably the two most iconic – or two of the most iconic chronographs, right? Um Whew, that's kind of difficult, man. Really? Um, this, this is so easy for I me. Think for me, I would go the <laughs> na the Speedmaster. Sorry. Yeah. I, 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 I just I, I I never liked the Navitimer. I just don't like the look of it. So for me, it's easy. Aesthetics wise, it's just speedy all the way. Right. Yeah. I mean, listen, I totally understand that. And obviously, for a lot of people, they prefer the the kind of more subdued look of a Speedmaster. But I think that the Navitimer definitely gets overlooked by the collector community. I mean, it is one of the iconic chronographs ever made, and I like, for example, the new 806 uh, release from Breitling. I think that's a great release. Um, I think there's a lot of Navitimers out there that can be had for a steal. 
So, so if I see the merits of owning an Avs after show. I'm a I'm a Breitling hater, Marco. Breitling hater now. I got no, it. I'm looking. I don't hate Breitling. I actually like the Premier V01. I like the new Chrono Mats they're doing. I like that bullet style bracelet. Right. Um, but that new platinum one looks really cool. <laughs> Honestly, I, I would. I, I hate to say like a beater, but I think that would be a great. I, I only say beater because I had a Breitling for so many years, and you could literally beat the shit out of that thing, and you would never get any dings, nothing. The thing is like a tank. I don't know how that platinum one would be, but I just love that blue. It's such a cool, you know, I like those kind of blues and things. You know, that that that's right up my alley. It's just a little expensive, but um, the Navitimer just never spoke to me. So for me, the Speedy's an easy pick. I got that 100. percent oh, Listen, I I'm not the biggest fan of chronographs either. JJ, I'm muting you because you're echoing, echoing. JJ, you got to get to the Lakut Studios, but um, I am, yeah. I am. I'm gonna come back. I actually, I'm gonna run to the post over soon. I just wanted to come and say what's up for a minute, and uh, no worries, I got no sucked into the vortex. He says, so I, I we got Alexito saying, so I got a wonderful 1950 VC patrimony. The problem with the vintage is the size. For today's taste, they appear female. Yeah, 100. percent I mean, listen, I mentioned that earlier in the show, right? Owning a Note 8 sub, a 40 mil, then owning also my Bruce Wayne, it's hard for me to go back to those more conservative sizes unless they wear big, right? And most vintage watches tend to wear smaller rather than bigger, unfortunately. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100%. We got JT saying, I have vintage watches and clocks, which is interesting because that's what I'm getting into, clocks and pocket watches. Those are the two that I'm sorry to get into. He says, to me, those are vintage stuff. The stuff from the 80s and 90s might be retro, but it's not vintage to my way of think. I, I get that. It's not, uh, man, I, I, I got to disagree, though. I, I get it, but I disagree 100%. It's definitely neo-vintage. I mean, come on, the clasp, the braces, the holes, the, the cases, they're totally different. The aluminum bezels. Right. I, it's I it's a completely say. different style build. Right. Yeah. This is, so my wife's models. Okay, nice. And that day date is 18238. Very cool. Very cool. We have never time or super cool, even if it can be a bit lot. I tend to agree. I tend to agree. We've got Yasha B saying, does anyone uh, know what was the price of those remote watch cases when they were available? I think they're a couple thousand, right? 2,000 or something like Not that. Sure. Right. They're pretty, they're kind of expensive considering, but they're very good build quality, really heavy, durable, heavy duty kind of stuff. We got Joel Hayes saying Navitimer is better than the Speedmaster. Again, to each their own, right? 100%. Remote watch case is 2K. I waited a while for it to pop up on their site, but you can DM Cars and Chrono. You got a spare one. <laughs> there you go. Design, I tell you, says drop the link. I did drop the link. There you go. But, um, yeah, I, I got to be honest. I think Neo Vintage is really the sweet spot, JJ. If I see anything... Going up in value, it's that neo vintage spot. Those kind of sixteen seven hundred, sixteen seven ten submar uh, GMTs, the sixteen six ten uh, Submariners. What was the one that uh, Nico said? This one six six one zero. I think the Sea Dwellers, the sixteen six hundreds, are gonna are gonna fly. We got Jason joining us back. Marco, well, now that Jason's joining us, <laughs> I'm gonna go run to the post office and I'm gonna catch you in about half hour or so. All right. No worries. Take care, JJ. All right. See you guys. Welcome back, Jason. Yeah. Is it better? Much better. Yes, much better. <laughs> All right, right. You. No cap. That's good. We got CB saying vintage or neo vintage over 36. They are fine. Yeah, I, I think 36. Like, for example, here, I brought this up on stream um, a couple of days ago or over the last couple of days. It's the Breguet 3237. Now, one thing about Breguet is they wear a lot bigger because of those lugs, right? Those lugs are really long. Now, this is a 36 mil case, but obviously this is kind of a 20 or so year old watch. I think this would fit tremendously on a modern wrist because of those lugs, right? Even though it's a 36 mil case, so more classically sized, I think because of those lugs, it definitely fits a lot bigger than its size and tens and you know, could definitely fit a modern wrist for sure. Yeah, I, I agree with the 36, 36 millimeters is a nice, good, old, timey, um, wrist size, uh, diameter size, right? But um, you know, it's getting back there. You know, it, it, 38 is being more common nowadays, and right. who knows? Maybe we'll go back to 36. It's just a cycle of uh, fads and trends. Yeah, one thing that's interesting is when you ask like people online, what's the perfect size? A lot of people will tell you in that 38 to kind of 40 range, right? Which is 
just off the cusp of like a lot of vintage watches, right, which are 37, 36. So I think definitely we might see a comeback to those smaller. I mean, we've already seen a comeback to smaller watches, right? I think people are starting to realize like, listen, you know, my size range that's acceptable is more in the 38 to 42s, but mostly like dress watch like this, I think 38 to 42 is probably ideal. Yeah, and it's not like ages since we prefer port 42. It's like just what, five, six years ago that we used to see people like um, preferring 42. And now we're going back to 40 and 38. And the thing is like, that's also brought upon with, with social media exposing the many nice dress watches that we're now um, clamoring for, that we're like trying to attain. But then again, who knows? Because um, the trend is changing once again. Uh, we used to have formal attires. We used we were talking about like the other day about um, dress watches. Do we need them? Well, do we need dress occasions? Do we need formal occasions? Nowadays, like most formal occasions, don't look that formal anymore. So, right. so the so with what niche will the will these dress watches that we call them? Occupy. I mean, will, will we just like call them time only watches or like conventional watches, whatever? But the, the size is some, sometimes the, the size is the true indicator because we don't, we rarely see chronographs at 36 millimeters. Most of the 36 millimeters you see nowadays, like, like modern watches, are, are time only. Yeah. Yeah. I I tend to agree. I mean, we got look at this. Bud the Sud saying, "I'm buying my brother 36 steel Wimbledon right now, as opposed to 41 for his 50th birthday." So that's one. We got also William Watch's podcast saying 36 mil is a great size. I ended up going back to 36 after wearing bigger watch. So I think definitely there's like uh, I, even Yasha B saying 36 is fine for an elegant slash dress watch. Um, yeah, I think. Listen, I think they tested the kind of upper limits of the, the size what size world. And I think there was definitely like a clear rejection or people are like, ah, maybe that's just not what we're into. And now people are kind of getting more into the kind of classically pr proportioned uh, wristwatches of old. And we got Timothy saying, I'd love to hop on the chat. Sure. Sure. No worries. I'll drop the link. You can feel free to join. Feel free to join. Chris Kelly saying the problem has been large sport bezels Je dials are generally the same size right right yeah so the sports bezels definitely make it wear I guess a little bit bigger I agree yeah hundred percent that's a great point because even Michael, they uh, I want to like highlight one um, overlooked vintage um, sure. piece I can pull it since up. we were like in, in that subject you know most most people like tend to overlook tags. But the silver stone is one of those ones that we re rarely see. But when you see it, you see that vintage vibe. But at the same time, you could get them like in the cheap nowadays. You're talking about the tag Hori silver stones, those kind of square ones, right? Yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be like the the the, the uh, successor to the to the monocle. Um, yeah. yeah, monocle. These ones right yeah, here. That one, yeah. You know what it reminds me of? It actually reminds me of um, there was an episode of Talking Watches with uh, I forget this guy's name, but um, he I think it was the head director, and he had this paddock that was actually quartz, or it had like a a quartz looking seconds hand, and it was kind of the same kind of TV style shape. When did this come out? In the eighties, maybe seventies, eighties? Yeah, this these came out in the eighties. Yeah, right. So it would be right around the same time as that paddock, and those that was actually a popular shape back it in is, the day. It, it is interesting. Right. And do you ever see these kind of square? Because uh, it's mostly square, right? It, it doesn't really look rectangular. But I guess we can say like square rectangle type watches coming back. Because most people are into round watches, right? Yeah. Um, we got a great question from Sean W. saying, Cardinal, thoughts on a Neo Vintage Speedy Reduce? Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of the Speedy Reduce. Thank you very much, obviously, for the Super Chat, Sean. Um, I'm not a, the biggest fan. If you are looking for a smaller size uh, chronograph from Omega, I would definitely go first Omega in space. Um, but yeah, it's something that I always struggle with. There's not a lot of like 38 to 40 or 42 mil chronographs that aren't the Speedmaster or the Daytona, which sells for ridiculous prices that I would actually 
you know, consider like off the top of my head, I can think of maybe the Breguet Type 20, the Type 21. Um, I could think of the Zenith El Primeros. I think those, I would be getting the new kind of Zeniths or even the the Zenith uh, of old, you know, kind of the ones that they just continued, the A386 case, as opposed to the Speedy Reduce. What do you think about this, Jason? Nice. Okay. <laughs> Jason is must be away. But yeah, I would definitely... Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, what were you asking? Sorry. No, so we just got a question about a uh, Neo Vintage speed or Speedy Reduce. And I was just saying, you know, there's not a lot of chronographs I can point to because I'm not the biggest fan of the Speedy Reduce, but there's not a lot of chronographs I can uh, point to that are kind of similar proportion. The only ones I think of are, you know, the A386 Speedmasters, or excuse me, the A386 Zenith El Primeros. I think the first Omega in space, that's a great Speedmaster. That's, you know, kind of smaller size, maybe the Brady Type 20 or the Type 21. Yeah. Uh I mean, if you could go for that, it's a lot more extra nowadays, especially right. with, with all of the, the hype that's going around it. But the speedy reduce, you know, that's also another another one of those um, chronographs that people tend to overlook. It's rather small, but when you actually wear them, though, it's a little thick. That's the I think that's the problem with people that people are having with the, with the speedy reduce. I used to want one, but when you wear it on your on your wrist, I don't know what it has. But it looks and it feels thick. So I think it's because of the long distance, or for, mm -hmm. for some reason, and that's turning people off. You know, I think it is an Eta movement with the Dubois de Pra chronograph, right? If I'm not mistaken, well, what, which makes it even worse. <laughs> right. Well, that's kind of the issue, right? Is that the service on it would be terrible for one, and it's like a very finicky, like that's more of a high horology type of chronograph, right? It's like the mechanism is very well, finicky. It's delicate. It's not super, it's not like modern build, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, and and the thing is like, if here's the thing about Omega, and like we, we always complain about Omega and their tons and, and multitudes of variations. Their price point also, just add a few more bucks and you could go for a good Aquater, you know? Right. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't get why they're like, like really limiting their, not limiting their, they're really trying to fill each nick, nick and cranny of their 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 um, price points. They don't have to do that. But then now you're you're left with these um, watches that people can't decide on, and right. th that's something that that sometimes is even worse than not taking a decision at all because you're left in the middle. I think this is also a great option is the Tudor Heritage Chrono. I think this is definitely um, an overlooked one. I think this is great. It, it harkens back to that kind of retro style. Um, again, an yeah, Edda Monte Carlo. And it has like that, right, exactly, that Monte Carlo. But it's called the Heritage Chrono. I always call it yeah. the Monte Carlo because that's the old name for it. But um, yeah, it's the, <laughs> it's, right. it's the, to me, it's the Monte <laughs> Carlo. I don't know why they would rename it, but it is what it is. And we do have Tim S. joining us. Welcome hey, to Tim. the show, Tim. How's it going? Thanks for having me on, Marco. Of course, of course. Always a pleasure to have a new panel member. I <laughs> guess uh, you, if you would like, just introduce yourself, maybe a little bit about you, how you got into watches, the collection, the whole kind of sh spiel and shebang. All right. Um, I, don't, I, got, I got started at like, uh, I always liked watches, but um, I kind of got into it like seriously. Not seriously, but getting into it in terms of like reading into it, not just liking date just and the presidents um, or the day dates. Uh, sorry, I'm spacing out. Um, I got a little Seiko, like a Seiko automatic because I, I had a, like a Nixon for the longest time, which was just not the watch to have. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no, uh, I mean, like, look, I mean, whatever watch you have, if it's your collection, it's the one that, pulled you into this community, to this circle of enthusiasts that we call ourselves crazy for like liking these like obsolete things. Yeah. yeah. No matter what it may be, it could be a Timex, it could be a Seiko. It's something that holds, uh, holds a, a spot in your heart. That's a part of your collection. Yeah. yeah we all start true. somewhere. I really, that's, I, I, that was a, it was a, it was a graduation gift. It was just, it's like the, I think the time teller Nixon. But I basically, yeah. I don't think I went a day without wearing it once. And that really changed, like, because if I didn't wear it, I felt naked. It was like, 
I love just having a time yeah. on my hands. It just makes it so much easier. It's such a simple thing. But um, What's it called? This past, right where I just graduated college this past uh, May, and I've been looking at, I, I've been looking at watches and then debating whether to get a Rolex. There's been a few other ones that I've been having my eyes on. So I think the day after I turned in like my last paper, I went in looking for um, one of the colored OPs. And it was kind of a, like a quick thing. For some reason, it's always like going in and you're nervous because you're trying to get something that they have that they probably don't have for you. But a uh, good, good experience explaining, explaining to him what I wanted. Um, I was looking for either the, the light blue, the Tiffany, and either 36 or, 30, or, uh, or 41, or the coral, same 36 or 41, and basically saying, just looking for a way to sort of mark the occasion, get into my first luxury watch, I guess, and sort of forgot about it after a few weeks, and was like, ah, oh, they're probably not going to get it for me. And then I think a, about a month later, I got a call um, while I was on another, uh, it was like a, a Zoom call, it was an important call. And I, I see the, the, the jewelry store calling me and I'm like, Dude, I, I, so I, I missed the call, called back and the guy was busy. He came back or he called me back a little bit later and was like, we got you the Coral Red in 41. If, if that's the one you wanted, I was like, perfect. So, and he said, he said, uh, or it's for, for next week. So I had to wait an entire week. And it was just probably not the most excited I've been, but the most giddy I've gotten about. Like, it's probably the longest just, week of your life, right? Oh, yeah. My, my <laughs> friends, my friends, my brother, like, they were sick of me talking about it. I was like, I can't wait till Tuesday. I can't wait till Tuesday. Right. But, um, but yeah, I finally. Is that what you're wearing I, today? Yeah. Nice. And I, I told myself, I was like, when I, the day I got it, I was like all like nervous and stuff. So I was like, I'm not going to wear this. Like I'll, I'll just like wear it like on the weekend or like if it's like for like a special occasion, not a special occasion, but like, you gotta wear it, or, like or, or doing something. And I've probably worn it six days out of the week. <laughs> There's nice. this, I don't know if you can see, but yeah, it's in, no, you're not nice. going to see it. But um, I already have some like decent <laughs> dings on it. It's, as I was leaving, I was like, is there anything like a protector I can get for the, the clasp or whatever? And he's just like, you're going to scratch it right. and just welcome it. And I was like, Arr. so the first time I scratched, it was awful. But now there's just little hairlines all over it. And yeah. Been enjoying it. We all, we've been all there. <laughs> right. I got, I started to get scratches, like micro scratches on my clasp, which I'm not looking forward to seeing every day, but it is what it is, you know? Once you get the first scratch, it's like, it is what it is at that point. Yeah. Because I just want to catch up on a couple of comments. Jamie yeah. J saying, remember, guys, vintage could be the smart move. The watch game is a lot of hype around the youth. We were all going to get old one day and our taste may shift. Yeah, 100%. I think that's definitely something that I mentioned earlier. I think the modern watch trend will kind of continue for the next 10 or 15 years because, you know, you don't just jump into the vintage world, right? It's a very scary kind of watch world because it's really a minefield right you don't know what you're getting sometimes and you know we we'll always recommend buy the dealer but it takes a certain evolution and and kind of of one's character and one's taste to really get into that vintage world but i totally agree with you jamie i definitely could see a uh, return to the vintage world we got yasha v with a great super or with a great chat saying i'd love to see a speed reduce with a new movement or at least off the shelf modern automatic movement in a modernized iteration. I tend to agree. I wish they would do it 100%. JT saying, great story. Now that is why we collect watches, 100%. And uh, Andres Spaghetti with a $4 super chat. Thank you so much. He's saying, Marco, what do you think of the Cellini Moonface? I, man, I tend to love these. I really think these are great. And not even that they're underappreciated. I think these sell for over retail, right? So yeah, I think these are amazing. Listen, you're not gonna get the kind of level of finishing of a Patek Philippe or of a Vacheron Constantin, but you know, I think you're still getting a phenomenal watch. It's very unique looking and you still get the very good, you know, kind of build quality of a modern kind of Rolex. And, and I think this is a no brainer. If you're looking to add this a dress piece, if you're a Rolex man, you know, and you want to add a dress piece, I think, I mean, an OP is a great choice, but if you want something on a leather strap, I think this is phenomenal. I'd agree there. There's something about a, a moon phase, and, it, and those have it tracks the date as well. Um, 
there's something about Moon Face Watch that it's 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 kind of obscure and most people don't see it, so only you know it and it's right. And even the moon is thing. made out of meteorite. So I mean you're getting like I, I really like also the kind of hobnail style bezel, right? The outer bezel. I think that's really cool. Obviously, you get alpha hands. Uh, the date hand is actually a blue blue steel hand. So and you're getting a, a lot of great quality from Rolex, and this is really untraditional from them. I mean, you don't see them kind of mixing these kind of things. Obviously, it's a dress watch. I wish that you know they gave us an open case back, and it's a well finished movement. But I think it looks great. I think this is great. I even like the other Cellinis, like the one that Obama was wearing. I think it's that white dial one. Um, here, let me pull it up. Yeah, so this one right here is the one that he was wearing. Just simple, time only, easy to tell time at a glance. I think this is this is what a dress watch is all about. It should be simple, classic, and uh, just you know, yeah. time only. That speaks to me more than the moon face, though. I like I like that more. Yeah, this is that. That says a lot about my taste. <laughs> right. I I think this is great. This is very under the radar. I mean. You look at this and you think it's just like another watch, right? And that's what I really like about it. It's really under the radar. I mean, most people will never know what the heck they're looking at. And I mean, I would probably admit it myself. I probably would never even notice somebody wearing this in my life, in, my, in like regular life, uh, just because it's so, just not something you see every day. Yeah, it's all about the, the smaller details. Look at those uh, long, thin horns that kind of tapers, um, more from the from the case going to the to the tip that slightly curved um uh leather strap you know you see uh, through the lugs there those subtle details those are the ones that like really hit me you know and, uh, that really appeals to me but uh, if you have too much of that too it's like it, it doesn't have that personality anymore compared to like something that's simple yeah, I, I think yeah, I think this is great. I really like this a lot. And, and again, obviously, I'm I'm biased to brands that sell at kind of a re similar kind of price pre-owned. Right? I think you can get a lot of stuff from Breguet, for example, where you get kind of cold rolled cases and precious metal cases as well that have an open case back, phenomenally finished movements. The dials are you know real guilloche or enamel dials. Um, but again, I mean, I, I think this is still phenomenal if you're. You want to get something from Rolex. Yeah. Well, now now we're talking about like um, these um, dress watches. A, a right. question to both of you. you know? If you guys have a watch that doesn't keep time anymore, that's actually broken, that you can't service it, would you still actually wear it? Because, of course, you could still look at your, your phones for the actual time. Would you still actually wear a broken watch? That's interesting. Uh, I would it have doesn't keep that. time at all. No, I have one. I have an Omega uh, Genev at home. Really, it's it's thirty four millimeter Genev, really old one. It was keeping time. It just stopped. But you know what? Sometimes I could still just like wear it. People won't care anymore. Anyway, I don't care. I just like how it feels on the wrist. I don't know. I, I feel I'm not the only one. <laughs> right. A lot of people, some people are saying, yes, we're pretty divided on this, actually. I you actually, said I would specifically. Yes. Sorry, continue. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. I was uh, I was in the car with one of my uh, friends, and his girlfriend was sitting next to me. And she, I think her, it was her mom's old, um, either like a Chanel or Gucci watch. And the crown, I was like looking at it, and the crown had fallen out and fallen off. And she's like, I wear it every day. So at that point, it becomes jewelry. So if you like the way it looks, then you check the time in a different way. I don't see. Right. It would annoy me, though, because I constantly will look at my, my wrist, even when I wear the, um, the, the um, Oyster Perpetual, because it doesn't have the date. And I'm used to having um, my Seiko with the day and the date. I'll look and be like, oh, shit, and then i got to check my phone. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, listen, I, I got to be honest, uh, Jason. I would not wear it just because I, I needed to tell the time. You know yeah, I mean? no, that, that's the point. It, it's, it's, it's a discussion. That's why it divides people, like, you know, people yeah. on both sides of the fence. 
Yeah, I mean, listen, I get the whole argument that it's jewelry, but that's just like if I look down my wrist and I can't tell the time, it's like uh, that'd be more frustrating than right. trying. It's actually frustrating. Yeah, exactly. Right. I think it's definitely frustrating. Well, the thing is, like, I guess in my, it's also based on our lifestyle. I have a life where I'm surrounded by screens all the time. Right, like right now, I have seven screens here. Three are off, four are on, and there's like two of them have have time on it. That's more accurate than the, than the zeros that I have on my hand. So, <laughs> I guess it's 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 all based on on preference. If you, yeah, like there's someone in the chat who said that if there's an interesting story attached to it, right. there's no way that you're going to get rid of it. You're going to wear it one way or the other. Right. I think it was cool, Chris Kelly. I'm going to try and find it, but yes, hundred percent. I'm pretty sure I remember him seeing that. Yeah, one second. Uh, yeah, it sounds like it has a great story attached. So I would definitely, yeah, I mean, listen, I understand the idea behind keeping it. I don't know if I would wear it. That's the only difference. We got the captain with a $5 super chat. He said, it's even a broken clock is right <laughs> two times a day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's fair. I'm going to drop the link if the captain wants to join us. But Tim, I know you wanted to speak with us uh, about vintage watches, right? Because you were oh, looking yeah. at one yourself. Did, uh, what was that? You were looking at one yourself, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Um, did you guys already talk about the um, the GMTs? Uh, no, but we can get into it. Sure. Um, I'd been, or I think I clicked on a little while back. I was looking through um, Chrono Twenty Four, and I just clicked on GMT Masters, and it started with. I'm like, these are like the black and gold ones, and then I found the um, the the old school root beers. I I don't know what it is, but to I've they're so different than the the modern one and they have this sort of i don't know the word but like 70s sort of vibe to them that i really like especially on the um the jubilee bracelet okay especially how the, those age what's the reference are we talking about um i think 1675 1675 yeah the 1675 is i mean <laughs> a real icon definitely surely collectible you prefer yeah. it on jubilee Right on Jubilee, that one, the the um, the root beer, the root beer on Jubilee. Okay, here. Yeah, and then okay. the older Pepsi's I like on the um, the oyster. I mean, listen, there's a there's a lot to love on this nipple dial if that's what you're into, right? I like the two tone kind of Jubilee. Uh, I think that's great. I hope that they maybe bring it back one day. Although I wish they do it in yellow gold, not in rose gold. I think in rose it might not look that great. Um, mm -hmm. I like the kind of almost like burnt orange and yellow bezel. That contrast looks amazing. It's very distinct for sure. Yeah. And you, you, if you go looking around some of the dials, if somehow or whatever sort of patina it gets, they'll get these sort of red. Um, tropical dial almost. Yeah, right? tropical dial. But it turns really. Yeah, some so of them something get, like this. Yeah. And some of them get really dark and then have this sort of gloss to them. Now let me ask, what do these trade for around? I'm not 100 percent sure. I've seen them in some watch groups, um, anywhere from like nine to like depends on the dial and condition. I think up to like maybe 14 for this, for close to this one. I, th I think there's there's a different dial. It's um, I think it's it's a silver dial with um, and the um, the six and the nine have ruby markers. Let me try and pull this up. Um, or slate, I, I forget the, what it is. I just saw that version for the first time a few days ago. So I think I know what you're talking about. I'm just uh, not 100 percent sure what the bloody thing. I think it's 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 not this right here, is it? No, it's is something it? similar to that, but that's that's not a root beer. That's the only problem. Yeah. Okay, let me see if I can pull it up. It's got to be on Chrono. But yeah, I, listen, if that's what they're training around, I think that's a steal for a GMT. That's that's why I, I was shocked because usually I'll just scroll past the – because there's only like maybe a few on Chrono in that, in, in that, in that, in that price range. And it's kind of easy to confuse them with the, um, the black dials. Okay, let's look at while scrolling through, I mean, side by side, it's – 
Oh, this is the one. This is the one right here. Yes. Yeah. I yeah, knew yeah. I'd seen not it silver, not silver. It's uh, right. It's more gold. Uh, yeah. Listen, I if these are so these are selling between nine and fifteen thousand roughly USD. I, I yeah. I mean, I don't know the exact sale prices on some of them, but. Whew. I mean, that's I listen. That's a great price for a neo vintage Rolex. No question about it. That's a really good price. All right, I would consider this vintage, right? We're talking what the that ha yeah, that has to be the eighties, I think. Uh, actually, I don't know. Uh, I don't even know what the reference because it's it's the, the it's the, um, the, the I don't I don't think they did this as a no, I guess they did. Maybe that one as the GMT um, Master too, but I'm pretty sure I think the one that I was looking at was just the GMT Master. See, actually, it was originally manufactured in 1995, so this would probably fall in the early 2000s. This, this uh, the one with the ruby dial, yeah, ruby dial, like this. Those ones sell for a bit more, I think. I could be wrong, but the so ones that I like are just the, the plain, right? Um, burgundy or whatever color dial you want to call that, yeah. So that reference dates back originally to about 1995 to the 2000s, is uh, the reference. And we got Alex with a five euro super chat. Thank you so much, Alex. He says, Marco, do you think the Pepsi 1675 with the tropical dial is worth buying? So I'll pull this up. So Rolex 1675 tropical dial. Do I think it's worth buying? Listen, you're going to pay, don't get me wrong. I'm going to pay through the roof prices for something like this, right? I mean, it's going to be expensive, really expensive, but is it worth it? I mean, there's no question about it from a, from a rarity standpoint. I don't think it gets much better than this. We're talking 16.75 with a Pepsi bezel and tropical dial. I think that contrast is just spectacular. There we go. That's a better picture. What do you guys think? I love not for me. Get on. <laughs> <laughs> See, the problem I have is it's a little bit finicky. Like it, you're going to pay a lot of money. Right. And it's almost like I, I would be so scared to wear something like this. You know what I mean? Like I would be, I would be in fear of wearing a watch like this and for obvious reasons. Right. I think it's just the, the cost alone would make it, you know, I mean, just look at this. It's about 80,000. Right. I think for 80,000, you you could buy a lot of great watches. Do I think it's worth buying? I don't think so. Personally, I think it's very yeah. cool. I think it's it would be incredible to add to the collection, um, but man, it's too. There's too much that can go wrong, and there's too much that that you know to, to consider that it's just like, man, I, I don't know if I, I if I would be willing to. And you're gonna pay through the through the nose kind of top dollar for something like this. Yeah, you can definitely get a lot, unless that's what you're really looking for, and that trumps all of the other. Uh watches within that price range yeah yeah and the thing is like the people the, the people or the collectors that buy these they probably have like two or three or four different pepsi rolexes out there already in their collection so to them that 80 something is not going to be like that much if it's yeah. if it's this isn't their first gmt yeah, or their, GMT. yeah they're, they're probably buying it for rarity or for something that has a unique story behind it or if a celebrity wore that and whatnot you know but um Right, look, to me, my, my, my bias is against Pepsi bezels. I, I just can't get into Pepsi bezels at all. I mean, that's sacrilegious because I have one. I have one. I have a 6139 <laughs> Seiko, which is, a, which is a Pepsi bezel, you know. But uh, on, a, on, on a dive watch with, with a rotating bezel, I just can't get to... Uh, get into a, a pepsi rolex yeah. and i would rather get a root beer instead maybe it's because i already have a pepsi vessel that's why but that's too that's reading too much into my own story <laughs> yeah i mean listen i'm a i'm a big fan of the pre-ceramic pepsi i think i like better the kind of more muted uh color scheme of the blue black bezel the batman colors but i like on the pre-ceramics the pepsi bezel I mean, I think for the price, you can get like a very good condition, amazing condition, 16, 7, 10 for like, you know, I mean, we're talking literally more than a fifth of the price of something like this, right? 
And CB says, be careful. Some of those tropical dials are induced in the microwave. I mean, <laughs> listen, there's a lot of fin there's a lot of shit that can go wrong when you're buying something like this. You know what I mean? I would I would stick to a 16700 if you want to get Swiss only dial. It's very simple. Um, 16710 is also great. If you want to get the best of the best, you can get like um, I think it's a 16710 with the 3186 movement. So you get the vintage look with the modern kind of uh, uh, kind of movement, right? The modern movement of, you know, GMTs before obviously the, the new 3200 caliber families. Um, so I think that's kind of the, if you want to, you know, kind of get a really good GMT, that's the one to get. And you're going to pay like 20,000, you know what I mean? So we're still talking wow. a fifth of the price. Right. So yeah, that's, listen, I think it's a great watch. It's incredible, but considering all the things that can go wrong, I mean, considering also, you know, when would you realistically wear this? <laughs> I would be so, so scared to wear this. Something goes wrong. How do you get it fixed? You know, these are all things to consider. So I think just given all of those factors, I, I would just tend to avoid it. That's just my opinion. But uh, yeah, Tim, we're talking about the root beer, right? Yeah, I was just going to say something about the root beer. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so but you're you're getting into the kind of Rolex GMTs, and man, I will. Oh, that's, say that's this. what it was. I'm a big proponent of the GMT. I think besides the sub, right? Because the sub is probably the most iconic watch. Yeah, probably the most iconic watch ever made, right? The Submariner is probably the most. Yeah. Iconic. If you ask somebody what's what's a watch or you know design a watch, probably most people would point to a Submariner, uh, especially Submariner date. Uh, I prefer the mm -hmm. no date; it's true to the original. But I think the GMT master line or any GMT from Rolex, right? If you want to include the Explore Two, I think it's the best watch that Rolex makes, and nobody makes a GMT like Rolex. Yeah, that's the one thing that I do like. I mean, say what you will about like Rolex being like the name that they are. I'm not the first person to say this. It's probably not the last, but their designs, it's something with the angles, the shapes, and the slight taper to the bracelets. I don't know. There's a reason why they became so popular. Right. I but, mean, um, yeah. Um, no, I've, I've grown to appreciate the um, GMT. Right, or I'm originally from Massachusetts, and right now I'm in um, uh, Tennessee. So the time, the slight time difference. I don't know if I'm making an excuse to look for a new watch, but <laughs> or have one on my list. But to, have, to, 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 tell, to tell the two time zones is a, a nice thing to have a nice little um, right. complication there. Right. I mean, as most of you know, I like to go on RT stream. Right. I always said the gym to even for local, that, yeah. Local to Brisbane, so we know what time <laughs> it is up in Brisbane, right? But yeah, it's nice to be able to time two time zones like that, especially obviously since you know you're in a different time zone. And I mean, we had Nico Leonard on the show yesterday, right? And Nico said, um, "What's it called? That uh, if he had to only get one watch, it would be a GMT Rolex because he travels, you know, quite a bit and he works with overseas kind of clients, international clients. So you know, it's just a useful complication for him." Yeah, and then I I have friends like different parts of the country. That's why I have a G shop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or that's it. That's it. <laughs> right. Boser says the sub is probably the most copied watch. Yeah, hundred percent. The urban road says you don't even wear your watch outside the house. People took one thing I said and then you stretched it so far. Like all I said was I would not jump into like a lake or a body of water with wearing you know my my watches and. It's only normal because if these things, you know, get fiked, I can't replace them. You know what I mean? I'm not made of money here, guys. But no, I, I'm, I'm okay. You They're two watches. They should be okay. They'll I know. survive. I know, but it's just like it's like that idea. Like I don't want to even try it. You know? Look, I, I live here. If you don't have to, I wear my, my Submariner all the time. It looks the same. You just wash it, wash it on the sink, and you're good. We got a beautiful tiger eye. GMT for oh, that's uh, the other nickname for them. Yeah, right. These are these are really really nice. And again, if they're really at that price, I don't know what the price is exactly on this. Um, but yes, I, I think that's a great that's a great watch. Just looks beautiful. Yeah, uh, and you and then sometimes like some of them are the, the the full yellow and sort of brownish gold, and then some go completely silver to that light brown. So you can kind of pick and choose what you like. Each one's kind of unique. 
We got West Pete saying, I need to know what time it is in the Austin Daniels world. Anyone see his lighted drunk fit? LOL, that guy. We got Kurt Anthony saying, Welcome to Rolex Symposium. I'm plastered. <laughs> oh, I love Austin's videos, guys. Austin is probably, in my opinion, he's probably the foremost authority on, I would say, vintage Rolex or neo vintage Rolex. I really like his videos specifically for that reason. And uh, yeah, I definitely recommend anybody who hasn't checked him out before, definitely do check him out now. We got Time Check saying, hi, Marco, how's things? Awesome, man. I hope everything is good on your end. But yeah, I mean, listen, this has been a great conversation about vintage watches overall. I think very productive. I think overall, the kind of take I get from this is maybe they're not underappreciated or they're not overlooked, but it's just that people haven't evolved their taste to really come and appreciate those watches yet. And that's really the fact that, you know, watch collecting to a lot of people is still very new. And, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong and hopefully, you know, they don't go wrong. But um, yeah, I mean, listen, is the vintage watch world worth considering? 100%. I think there's a lot of great watches out there to be had. We got Mr. Cassio with the $5 super chat. He said, insure your watch. And as long as it's not replaceable, enjoy yourself with it okay but you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna film a video so people leave me alone just jumping into a lake and say now you can't say nothing anymore <laughs> <laughs> oh that was a question i had for you mark when you got the um or even the, the, the no date sub are yours insured uh they're not insured but i do have a bank bank safe so you know i only keep one watch like i'll keep my pam at home you know what i mean because mm -hmm. it's not you know it is it's not a, a hot ticket item, but I will only keep one Rolex at home at any one one given time, you know? Yeah. I've been off and on about getting mine done, but... Yeah, insurance is, insurance is kind of a weird thing. I know uh, the captain, who's a regular contributor to the show, he got all of his watches insured, so he doesn't care anymore, you know what I mean? But, mm. um, like... It's definitely worth it because it's not super expensive, right? You can, I mean, Hodinkee has the new insurance and the only cost you maybe a hundred bucks a piece if it's Rolex, right? Modern Rolex because it's 1% of yeah, the, that's what, the yeah. value of the watch. So, I mean, it would take you a hundred years basically to buy back your watch through insurance, which is, you know, it's a very reasonable price. Not like they're price yeah. gouging you or anything like that. No, that, that's what that's, I forget I was talking to about it. Maybe my brother. And he was just, I was like, I should probably just do it because, it, I mean, it's $100 a year. And like you said, if trying to pay the same thing to get it back, it's just not going to happen. Right, exactly. Uh, and listen, we got JT who's coming at me saying, not insured, what the fuck? And Totem was saying, insurance is cheap. Yeah, 100%. Insurance is definitely cheap. Um, he says, I pay 250 a year extra coverage for 50 of uh, 50000 Yeah. So, I mean, listen, that's a great price, 100%. To me, it's just like, like, what do I need to – like, I don't have a massive collection, right? I only have three watches – or two watches that I would really insure. You know, the Pama, we just wouldn't insure. So it's just – it's not really worth it. I might as well just save myself the time, hassle, and the money and just get a safety deposit box instead. Right. That's true. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much. I need to jump off. Jason, take care. Thank you for jumping Catch on. Catch you guys later. Time check. Bye. Yeah. Take care. Nice Thanks time. again. We got good advice. Safe deposit box is the best way to go. Listen, all people will have different uh, different takes on what they prefer. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, safety and security is a very personal thing. You got to decide what's the best option for yourself. So that's really all it comes down to. We got Mr. GMT joining us saying, hello, hello. Hope you're well, my man. We got Sean in the Dark. Hello. Thank you for joining. And uh, we got Nefarian who's joining us as well. Hope you are well also. But uh, yeah, Tim, may I ask, so you've got the Oyster Perpetual in the collection, right? Yeah. That, is that the only kind of watch you have or you have other watches? Kind of. And this is, where I, this is another thing that I wanted to say is that I had the Seiko that I have. The, um, it's a little, I don't know, I'll show it to you. It's a, an Arabic dial Seiko. Okay, uh, nice. I don't, I don't know if you can. Yeah, we can see it. It's the Seiko 5, right? Yeah, the, the Seiko 5. Um, it brings me just as much joy as the, the op yeah i mean listen that's what watches i used to have right that orient watch that i pulled up numerous times it's the watch that kind of i call it got me into watches right because it got me into mechanical wrist watches didn't know what i was buying at the time so 
you know, I honestly speaking, looking back on it, I wish I would have kept that one and sold the Hamilton instead. But mm-hmm. it's like, you know what I mean? Like, it is what it is. You know, you live and you learn, and uh, it is what it is. And um, yeah, I mean, listen, you can't keep everything. And those watches do tell a story, which is great. And it's it's what gets you into the hobby. So I don't think there's any problem with <laughs> having those kind of, I guess, watches at the more affordable end. I think they're still great overall. Oh, yeah. I think I think this was like a – in order to get it to my doorstep, I think it was like 120 US. Right. Uh, and you're getting a lot of watch for – like a lot of value tons. for money. Right. Or, at at least in my opinion, yeah. But uh, – and I have no stress about this. I can bang it on things and whack it on doors and – it's just carefree and it's surprisingly wears large for, I think, I don't know if it's 34 or 35, but it wears, I don't know, maybe it doesn't, but to me, it doesn't feel small. I Meaning it's not, it doesn't shock me when I swap these out. So we got a, a really funny guy. We got Mir R saying, I leave my watch with my mother-in-law and Godzilla keeps. <laughs> 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 That's, that's the comment of the day. I love it. it. Says I love the watch hobby time check. Yeah, I agree. It's it's really great. You get to meet a lot of very, very cool people uh, in the hobby overall. And Tim, I think if I'm not mistaken, we had DMs. We exchanged DMs. Via uh, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I messaged you the night of the. Um, I think it was Saturday night. Right, and you're big into cigars, also, right? Not wildly, but I actually used to be at a. <laughs> not the not the right age, but early on like i think like 17 or like 18 i got i am weird like that i'll get oddly i mean explaining my watch obsession now i get very deep into things <laughs> but um i was just um <clears throat> sorry uh my dad had been was going down to uh, aruba sort of right i was as i was graduating so it worked out as a nice little um a nice little little trip and i was i went there and, and grabbed some because i hadn't had any in the longest time but uh yeah, they're they're definitely they're definitely nice as a, a treat. I can't have them always, or not always, but I like to keep them as a treat, I guess. Yeah, it's a treat. It's like I I view it more as like a, you have it maybe a couple times a year. It's just fun to, um, to to you know. It's very relaxing. Also, it's very. I don't like to tend to smoke with other people. Like I like doing it by myself. You know what I mean? It's just very relaxing, very personal. Uh, but I like I also doing it in a kind of a group as well because you get to share some cool memories. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there's Sam there's, and join. there's different types of um, not ways to smoke, but like different settings. Like one's just more I'm focusing on this for however long it, the thing is or however long it lasts. And then there's some things where it's sort of like the, not the f- facilitator of like the conversation, but it's, what the whole group is doing. It's some sort of um, not activity anchor. It's like a bonding bonding yeah. kind of experience, right? It really helps bond you, right? Both are saying smoke we eat every day. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. No worries, time check. You take care. Thank you for stopping by. But yeah, I mean, listen, I, I really enjoy cigars. I'm still, you know, relatively, I've only been smoking about three years, now three or four years. So now I'm just trying to experience a lot of, as many as possible, just so I can, Know, kind of develop a palette for this kind of stuff and really kind of hone in my taste and then ultimately just buy what I like, right? You know, some some people th- like Nefarian say, I'm a simple guy, Fuente, short story, or dial it off number two, right? Which are, I mean, I've heard great things about the both of them, right? Sometimes it's just cool to have, you know, just a couple cigars that you kind of go to every day and, you know, you just smoke those. It's great, right? Mm-hmm. Nefarian says it's a social thing, 100%. I will say when I do have one, I do like to have, um, I can't do the huge ones or like anything past, um, geez, I guess I've really been out of it. I forget the freaking names, um, <laughs> the sizes, uh, but like, like we're talking like, Churchill, I, Churchill's the biggest, but then there's also yeah, the, uh, anything bigger than a Corona, I think. Okay. Anything bigger than a Corona, I can't really do, but I like it time wise, like 40, like in, in between like 30 to like 45 minutes and maybe a little extra. I mean, it depends on how active you are with it, but, right. and even like the smaller ones just to have. I'm with you. Actually. Ones, but... I'm kind of with you. I used to like those big 
f off kind of churchill size <laughs> yeah. cigar like it's just like it was a long small like a lot an hour and a half two hours and you know, i used to think i really liked them but nowadays like i'm just into like the short if i can get like a 40 minute smoke maybe an hour yeah. at most like i'm good with that you know what i mean it's perfect yeah i i, I agree there and then sometimes it's especially when like if you haven't had one for a while like, it takes a toll out on you whether it's the the, the nicotine or just the heat in your mouth and then afterwards you need to drink a bunch of water and brush your teeth a couple times right churchill's 47 mil range and it could be up to like i think even bigger right i think it can go up to like 50 or 52 which is just insane i think that's really great it's really too big actually we got um too much time on your hands with those ones. Richie Rich says, please email, email me, please. Here, I'm going to put my email in the chat. If anything, just email me just because it's hard for me to reach out to everybody. I already got like 25 messages I got to get back to once I'm done with the stream. But I'm going to go on for another um, another 10 minutes and then I'm going to wrap this show up because I know JJ, he wanted to do a pre-show also. And I do want to just get a, um, a break in between. We got on her own time saying, oh, by the way, hello, Kelly. Hope you're doing well. Guys, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Kelly on her own time. She's got a great channel, up and coming YouTuber. She's going to be a huge success. No question about it. She says, a cigar and a bourbon on my back deck is absolute heaven. See, even ladies can be into cigar. Hey, it's very relaxing. We got Sean the Dark Donates. Hello, Sean. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you, man? I'm doing all right. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. So, how have you been enjoying the kind of vintage, neo vintage talk? Uh, it's been pretty good. It's been lightning. Right. A little different, a little off the beaten path. I figure we mostly talk about modern watches, modern watch news and stuff like that. I think it's always good to remind ourselves that there is a whole other world out there for people to explore in the wristwatch community. Yeah, I do I do feel that um it's lost or not lost light on, on, on vintage, but I feel like it's become a thing that even if you paid um the premium and not retail having one of the modern ones is more of a status symbol because it is either the story that you were lucky enough to get it from the the ad or you're well off enough to buy it second hand right. not second hand but um great market so i think that might be part of the equation yeah i mean listen i bought the pam as a you know graduation gift for university <laughs> that's what i told my mom about you know a year or two ago and uh then I, I bought the sub. I was like, no, no, mom, this is my actual graduation gift. And then since then, you know, I bought the first It's way. just a placeholder. Obviously. Yeah, exactly. You know, I just listen. And then I bought the make. I said, you know, there's always an excuse to buy another watch. You know, you can definitely conjure something up. No worries at all. Yeah. Um, you know, what watches are kind of a funny thing? Cars, cigars. It, it, it can all run into a terrible lot of money and the only advantage to cigars and watches is they don't take up near as much room. Right, exactly. Very true. <laughs> I, 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 I forget. I forget who said it, but there it was. Uh, you can't take your, you can't drive your portion to a party, or you can't drive your portion to like a, a meeting. True. Right. You know, I I didn't own a watch for years. When whenever I started junior high, guys, you. Tell you how different times have gotten. You got a you got a what and a watch when you started junior high. That was the tradition because you needed to know your classes, and so you moved from classroom to classroom. And so to get you involved in the grown up world, you needed a wallet and a watch. Now it's like. You get a phone and you don't need a watch. And I'm like, huh? That's a completely different world to me. Right. we got Klein Farmer joining us. Hello, Klein Farmer. Hope you're doing well. And EPC saying, love my 2007 GMT 16710. Other than the clasp, it's pretty cool. The aluminum bezel has points of difference than modern iteration. Yeah. And I think those 16710, honestly, if I didn't get the Bruce Wayne, it probably would have been the direction I would have gone. You know what I mean? Either that or the 16700 kind of birth year watch. I'm a big fan of that kind of retro style, the Pepsi bezel. I think it looks great. And 2007, you get kind of the more updated 
I guess bracelet you get I think you get the solid end links as opposed to the hollow one so the bracelet's a lot less rattly um so yeah I think I think that's kind of a sweet spot in the kind of neo vintage Rolex world really really good stuff but yeah I mean listen guys I want to appreciate I want to say thank you so much I appreciate you guys coming on I think I'm going to wrap this show up a little bit early because I do want to get something to eat I haven't even had lunch yet so yeah, wow. definitely, definitely want to get something to eat. But uh, yeah, I want to say thank you guys for joining. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks Always for having me. Always welcome on the on the panel. Anytime you want to join in, Sean the Dark, appreciate you. Appreciate you. Uh, we got Jason, obviously from Design Atelier, who joined us earlier. JJ, who also joined us. Guys, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe the video. It's been a productive and fruitful conversation, in my opinion. And uh, I appreciate you guys stopping by. Make sure, of course, to check out my guy, Gentleman's Hangout. JJ is going to be doing a pre-show. Uh, to Archie's show in about, I don't know, half an hour or so. So be sure to tune in. And, uh, guys, I'll see you in the next one. We're in the sub. Awesome. Wear your watches, guys. Wear your watches.